The Senate Executive Committee will please come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senator Severson, Senator Rezin, Senator Redonio, Senator Lechtefeld, Senator Brady, Senator Murphy, Senator Trotter, Senator Sainz, Senator Raul, Here. Senator Munoz, Here. Senator Link, Here. Senator Lightfoot, Here. Senator Hunter, President Tellerson, Senator Claiborne, Senator Silverstein, Mr. Chairman. Here. We have a quorum to conduct business. Uh, first, housekeeping, blueroomstream.com has requested permission to record and videotape uh, the uh, proceedings. Is there any objection? Seeing none, permission is granted. We have seven legislative measures that have been assigned here. The plan is to take up the two measures sponsored by members of the Senate who are not members of the Executive Committee. I believe those two will move relatively quickly. We'll then turn to the three constitutional amendments which have a constitutional deadline. And then, time allowing, we're going to return to two um, amendments from members of the committee. We are scheduled to meet again tomorrow, and these measures are posted for both hearings. If we run out of time, we'll be able to turn to that. So with that, uh, Senator McGuire, are you ready to proceed? You have a floor amendment, number one, to Senate Bill 2824. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Senate Floor Amendment 1 to Senate Bill 2824 gives students aged 18 to 21 in Southern Illinois University's new fermentation science program the ability to taste but not imbibe, a.k.a. swish and spit. That's an excellent presentation. Senator Raul is convinced and moves to recommend you adopt Floor Amendment number um, 1 to Senate Bill 2824. For the record, there are no opponents to the bill. The uh, FAU is in favor of it. Uh, is there a leave for the attendant roll call? Seeing no objection, leave is granted, and the bill will be so reported. Thank the you. The amendment will be so reported. Is Senator Hastings here? With leave of the committee, uh, I'd like to turn uh, to uh, first uh, uh, my constitutional amendment, Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number One. Representative Lang is here as our partner in the House, and I want to do, try to accommodate his schedule. So, Senator Silverstein, would you be uh, willing to take the chair here? No problem. Um, this is so constitutional Amendment Number One. Let's see if there's any. Do we have any? Uh, we, uh, we have. I need to see the witness slips here. Or we don't have any. Just a few. We have 51 opponents, t 10 opponents, and no position. If we'd like, if we can get one opponent or one proponent, uh, you can discuss among yourself who will be the speaker. I'd appreciate it, S uh, Senator Herman. Thank you. I, I, I'm happy to present uh, the, the amendment, and if we need uh, testimony from Representative Lang or from any of the proponents, we can certainly bring them up to answer questions. He'll, he'll be the He'd expert. Be happy to answer or have anyone uh, testify in opposition. This constitutional amendment is one the uh, Executive Committee has considered and uh, 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 approved in the past. It is the fair tax constitutional amendment. It would allow Illinois to enter the modern era and join most of the states that have an income tax in the federal government in imposing lower income tax rates on lower uh, income levels and higher tax rates on higher income levels. Uh, we have uh, uh, full partnership in, in uh, the House of Representatives, and I appreciate Representative Lang uh, coming over to be available. The the language before us today is identical to what we have seen before. The new um, information is, a, is a, uh, a companion bill introduced first by Representative Lang in the House, and just uh, in the last 24 hours I've introduced an amendment to a Senator Hutchinson bill to adopt the same rate structure that Representative Lang has proposed. And this is very important to understand. If we send this amendment to the voters, and the voters approve it as I expect they will, then we would have the authority as a General Assembly to enact by law a tax cut 
for 99 percent of illinois families it's also a tax cut for the overwhelming majority of small businesses who are organized in a way that they pay taxes at the individual tax rate well it may not be ninety nine percent it's certainly going to be something approaching that a family with two incomes or a small business would have to earn more than seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in a year in profit that they put in their pocket at the end of the year to be impacted negatively by tax rates in this proposal everyone else in illinois would get a tax cut and i think that's a critical importance so i've enjoyed great support from my colleagues in the senate on this over the last several years and again i'd ask for your support in advancing this to the senate for full consideration thank you mr herman let me just do this to clarify it has to pass uh voted on by the voters it passes and then then we're allowed to uh entertain a bill correct we could pass a bill conditioned upon passage by the voters of the constitutional amendment that would be of no effect if the voters chose not to ratify the amendment um but yes the amendment needs to be approved by the voters in order for the tax rate proposed to go into effect let's add senator murphy to the record anyone any other proponents any opponents Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The, um, my name is Todd Meisch. I'm president and CEO of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, and we are opposed to uh, this proposal to go ahead and uh, have Illinois uh, develop a progressive tax. We do believe that the flat tax is a fair tax. It's undeniable that if you make more, you pay more. Uh, and I think it's also you need to look at it in the context. We know that a number of other states uh, do have a progressive income tax. Uh, but when you look at our state of affairs here, uh, we believe that this flat tax, because it is fair, is one of the positive aspects of our business community. And we think that it's a real uh, economic development bad policy to identify your advantages and make them go away. So we think that the, the flat tax is definitely the way to go. Uh, because, again, we also, uh, policymakers, a lot of people really like to tout uh, the entrepreneurial uh, successes that are happening, especially in the city of Chicago. Uh, people like to tour 1871 and, and be ready for the next big thing. Uh, well, the people who are working very, very hard to make uh, those companies be the next big thing uh, aspire to make the kind of money that is would be impacted in the plan as it's set out right now. Uh, so we think that uh, you know, there was discussion a little bit in the House about, well, there's higher taxes in California and other things. Well, California's got a lot of different other items that Illinois will never have. Uh, so there are a lot of different variables at stake there, and to identify one of the po most positive things about our business community and target it for elimination, we think, is very bad policy. The uh, last thing I'd say as well is that while we have a flat tax rate, everybody pays the, the same rate, this General Assembly has signed into law a number of things uh, that has made uh, the, um, uh, the tax less burdensome on lower income individuals. Uh, there was a report out just on Monday about how 45% of all taxpayers uh, at the federal level uh, don't pay any income tax. They have no income tax liability at all. Uh, that, we think, while it may not be the exact same percent, we think very much in the same magnitude is the case here for Illinoisans. So roughly 40%, granted an estimate, pay no income tax whatsoever, and those at the very lowest end of the uh, income spectrum benefit from a refundable earned income tax credit. So we would argue that while the rate is flat, uh, that our uh, system as it currently exists is very well uh, focused on uh, taking care of people at the lower end of the spectrum by not having them uh, pay taxes and in many instances actually get money from the 55% or so uh, that are paying taxes. So uh, we think that, uh, again, uh, the flat tax is the way to go. I think it's you, <coughs> if we make this kind of change and think that it's not going to um, have repercussions, I think we're wrong. I think most of us uh, saw the press reports about how the uh, city of Chicago was third globally for out-migration of millionaires. Uh, Athens, Greece did better holding on to its millionaires than the city of Chicago did. Uh, we think that that is a real indicator we should tread very, very lightly on uh, <coughs> these proposals that seek to gouge the rich, but I think will be viewed negatively uh, across the board. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Let's have Senator P President Cullerton and Senator uh, Brady and Senator Leckefeld to roll. Any questions? Senator Murphy. So um, is, there, w is there any cap at all in this amendment to the corporate income tax rate? 
Uh, I think uh, different, uh, I'm advised by Keith, uh, my tax uh, guru, that this version in the Senate that does do away with the eight to five ratio, uh, which currently I think is in the House version, uh, but that would, that is the, uh, the, the, the I guess the binding to keep that uh, corporate tax from being jacked up to 30% while individuals pay 2% or whatever uh, extreme example you want to use. I believe that in this legislation that 8 to 5 ratio is, is removed. But Senator, I would, have to, I would like to add here, there is no proposal to change the corporate income tax rates. And the change in the, indiv in the individual income tax rates would be of great benefit to small and medium-sized businesses in the state. Because unless each owner of the business is taking home at the end of the year profit in excess of three quarters of a million dollars, they're, they're not going to be paying an increased income tax. And I, I want to be very clear because you're talking about two different things here. You're talking about your intent I'm talking about and a piece of legislation you would pass. Absolutely. I'm but we're about also talking about table. an amendment to the Constitution. Correct. And, it, you know, if a future General Assembly uh, didn't have your uh, keen sensitivity to the concerns of the business community, uh, they would, with the amendment that is being passed here, have the latitude to have a corporate tax rate substantially higher than today's and substantially disproportionate to the individual rate in the future. And, and uh, that is that is something that eight to five that was so important was put into the constitution is being done away with here and i and i guess would you support it if i put the eight to five back in no i'd find an i'd, I'd, I'd have other <laughs> arguments that, uh, that <laughs> i don't like this bill for a whole lot of reasons the fact that i chose this one first <laughs> doesn't mean i'm done with the issue but um but i do think that's a significant issue that uh, that you know why don't we why don't we take this up in a couple two three weeks and and we'll uh, you know we'll 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 create we'll put it back in subcommittee we'll talk about it a little bit more and uh, no I, I from a from a business standpoint Todd um, are there any other issues I mean, what does this say to the rest of the country from a business tax climate from your and your members perspective if we are doing away with this. I think it's done uh, as is, uh, discussed here in isolation without uh, addressing any of the other underlying problems with spending in the state and, and structural uh, changes that need to happen in state government uh, that I, I think it will be very much negative. I will also tell you that um, I think that uh, the $1.9 billion uh, estimate that's on here, and uh, Representative Lang, in, in my perception of his testimony is yesterday, is that, hey, we could have gone and tried to go for $9 billion, but we wanted to keep it modest. I will tell you that there are two concerns. First, Lou's known for his modesty. Uh, he is, uh, I'm sorry, the $1.9 billion estimate, I think, is probably based on, though, it's a static model. I do, people can move, especially those at the high end of the, uh, our earners. They are most capable to decide to take their assets, their companies elsewhere. So I think that $1.9 billion is unlikely to materialize, and it also goes, uh, to, uh, leaves a huge hole that we believe, well, I, I certainly take the, the legislators at their face value that the plan they put out there is what they intend to pursue, but we also know that there are going to be an awful lot of voices trying to convince the other 175 members of the General Assembly that they ought to go ahead and we have more revenue needs uh, because the backlog of unpaid bills, as we all know, 7.5 on their way to $9, $10 billion. Uh, I, we think very strongly that, well, these legislators, we certainly take at first face value their intent on, these, uh, uh, on this plan. Uh, we think that there is going to be viewed, uh, there's perception there's great exposure that this plan would be the brackets ratcheted down and maybe the top <coughs> level brackets added. Uh, so I think the perception is going to be very negative. Sir. Thank you. Senator Rezin. Thank you. A question for you as well. What happens when the, well, when the economy is good uh, in this proposal, obviously there's a lot of revenue coming in. Um, we have um, budget surpluses, but can you explain to me what happens when the economy slows down? What would happen to our budget? Well, to the extent it relied on that 1.9 billion, yeah, I think it's going to be somewhat volatile. But you know, as is sales tax and other things. I think it's um, not exactly your question, but where I thought you were kind of headed. Uh, number one, yeah, it's 
it's going to be volatile, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, income tax is certainly among high a uh, wage earners uh, that are getting a lot of their wealth maybe out of the markets uh, or their businesses are going up and down. Uh, that that is, uh, it's going to be probably more volatile. I wouldn't put a number on it, but I would say more volatile. The important thing, though, also to keep in mind is that the small businesses that would be hit with the higher tax, if they have a bad year and lose money, uh, they wouldn't have a tax liability that year. But unlike a corporation, they cannot carry those losses forward to other years. So if you're in a very volatile situation, you have one good year, you get socked with 9.75%. Uh, but if the next year you're back in losses, you don't get to carry those losses forward. If you're a C Corp corporation, we smooth that out and allow you to carry forward those losses. Uh, if you're a small business impacted by this, uh, you don't get to do so. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Senator Mr. Meisch, could you, could you explain to me what you think a small business is? Small businesses can be measured in a lot of different ways. Uh, but just because you are making $750,000 in a year does not mean that you have uh, employed 500 people. You can have a business, especially if it's intellectual property, where it is a small business and you may not have a lot of employees, but if you've got great intellectual capital or if you're very, very good as a specialty law firm or such, you can do very, very well, but still your footprint uh, is not very that large in terms of employment and, and uh, property and But if and such. each and every owner of the small business is at the end of the year profiting a half a million dollars, three quarters of a million dollars, a million dollars, that's not the small business that's getting by on a 2% margin that we are taught to, to pay attention to. You, you're, you, you can't have it both ways. And if you're, if you're earning that much money in profit after all of your expenses, after all of your costs of doing business, maybe you're not a small business in, in the rubric we are using here when we talk about trying to foster small business development. And I would gather that the vast majority, 90, 95, 99 percent of small businesses fall into the category that I'm describing and not the one that you're describing. I would agree with you. I would just say over my 23 years in the chamber, I've talked to a lot of businesses. Uh, and no, you are correct. Most will, uh, especially when they're starting out, don't take any salary. But you know what? I do believe um, that the vast majority of them say that, you know what, I aspire to be very successful. And when I get there, I don't want my tax rate to go from 3.75% to 9.75%. Only on the marginal income. I want to, there's been some miscommunication on that. It's only on the dollar above the threshold. I know you understand that, but for folks who are, are listening, it's not, you're not paying more on the first million dollars of income. You're paying it only on the amount over the, the, uh, the threshold. For the, the 750 at the 8.75. So, so anything else? Senator Rowell. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, that there were other states uh, that have a progressive uh, tax system. What, what's the circumstance with uh, our surrounding states? I really, well, surrounding states, uh, I don't have all that here in front of me. I, I do. get it. You've got it. Uh, and they're higher. Um, but again, I would caution. I, I'm not saying that those millionaires that left that I talked to the city of Chicago left for only one reason, that they didn't like the 3.75 going to 5. I'm not saying that's the only reason. But I'm saying it is a definitely a factor. And when you go ahead and put all of those in, you have to look at everything else that's happening. Uh, and whether it be taxes in the city of Chicago, the fact that you know, second highest property taxes in the state, you have to look at everything. And going from 3.75 to 9.75 75 is not going to be viewed positively. Right. So, so that was the other thing I was going to get to. You, you, you said um, doing this without structural changes. You say you kind of qualified. Um, I, I, I'm wondering whether you just per se against something that would allow um, allow for greater flexibility for us to f fashion a, uh, a tax system, um, whether it's the companion bill or anything else, you're, you're just for restri restricting the capability of the General Assembly to fashion an income tax system that uh, is appropriate for the state. Let's assume that, this, that the General Assembly is also addressing the structural reforms and, mm -hmm. and, and but, but wants to move away from over-reliance on regressive cons consumption uh, taxes and, and wants to have the flexibility we are so. perhaps well. First of all, it's like we are for the flat tax policy-wise. We think that is fair, and we think it's an advantage that Illinois should definitely keep. 
Uh, in terms of other uh, revenue discussions, we might be more um, flexible than you might think, uh, but it is in the context of making state government more efficient, uh, making, the, uh, making growth of the economy a big priority. Uh, so we're open to pretty wide range uh, in discussion, but we do believe the flat tax is a real advantage for us because it is perceived by the people who create jobs and make investment as fair, and we ought to keep it. And so you're for that, that notion of that being in the Constitution, just restricting our ability to explore different things. I'm going to get to the 8 to 5 ratio, same type of question. Uh, what's magical about 8 to 5? Uh, I, not having been around in, in uh, 1970, I think that it was probably a compromise. Uh, that the business community came in and said, you know what, we need some kind of limiter to make sure that uh, the business community somebody doesn't get gouged or pay all the bills while you keep um, uh, rates down. But there's nothing, there's nothing scientifically magical about 8 to 5 versus 8.25 to, to, to 4.8 or anything like that. I don't have firsthand knowledge. It sounds like a compromise between people who went to a So it sounds like convention. it's pretty arbitrary, right? You know, it's, it's, there's nothing that you, nobody can point to anything magical about 8 to 5, but we're restricting ourselves to 8 to 5 simply because they said 8 to 5. Well, there are a lot of things in the Constitution that restrict the General Assembly that we're for. Uh, yeah, I'm so talking about this particular thing since it's just, it's it's yeah. relevant well, it, to it, this it's bill. provide. I think it was you know I think that if, if it was up to the business community and our representatives in 1970 had written it by themselves, we would have probably asked for parity. My guess is there was give and take on other items, and they said you know what eight to five is a restriction. Yes, we pay more, but at least we've got some kind of cap. So perhaps it was if a compromise. we perhaps if we lifted that mandate, you can the business community can make that uh, make that argument that uh, there should be parity. Well, no, there's nothing that prevents you from doing parity now. That's the upper limit. There's no downside. You but could you could make the corporate rate zero today. But if you, you, you understand to. what I'm saying is is that, is that in the in the best of worlds, um, you have a legislature that's unrestricted and can can have these conversations and, and negotiations and not be restricted by an arbitrary ratio that you can't point to anything that's scientific about it. Like I said, there are a lot of constraints on the General Assembly in the Constitution that we're very much supportive of. This is one of them. Seeing no other question, uh, Senator Herman. Just to, to close up this. Wait, oh. Senator Brady has a question. And maybe it's more of the sponsor. Um, how would um, a sub S corporation be taxed in this regard? The same way they are today as an individual taxpayer. So, well, the, the owners of the S corp would, the money would flow through the S corp, and they would pay it at the individual tax rate. Is on that what you're asking? On an individual basis, Correct. not a corporate. So this only affects those C corporations by definition. No, no, it, it doesn't affect the C corporation. We're not making any change. Well, I'm sorry. It depends what your question you're asking. In the pr rate proposal that Representative Lang and I have filed, there is no change to the corporate tax rates that apply to C corporations. The constitutional amendment allows us to uh, apply lower rates to lower income levels and higher rates right. to higher income levels that would apply conceptually to individuals or to the corporate tax code. So if, if, if I'm a, if there's a C corp, if there's an S corporation out there that's owned 100% by a resident of Danville and they make, that corporation makes $5 million a year. In, that individual, in profit? Yes. Okay. Uh, that individual would pay taxes on that $5 million at the current Illinois individual tax rate. Um, if they, I don't want to give them tax advice. If they earned, if the, money, the income is attributable to Illinois and not allocated to another state, then uh, yes, I, be, I believe that's, that's the case. Yeah. If they move across the border mm -hmm. and their corporation stays in Illinois, but their sub S income is now directly attributed to their individual tax return, where I do think they still pay taxes in Illinois because they earn I don't, money in Illinois. I don't believe they do. But let, let's say for a minute that they they didn't. Would that alter your opinion of this piece of legislation? Uh, 
or this constitutional amendment? I, there, there have been so many oversimplifications of the tax. But I mean, it's an important issue. Would you not agree? But where, where shouldn't is the, we know where, the answer to that question before we? Where the income is earned determines where the tax liability is. Not necessarily. I think we have a difference of opinion as to that, and maybe there are some some nuances. But I, I, I'm quite, I'm not positive, but I think. An important issue like this ought to at least we ought to have an expert from the Illinois Department of Revenue before we voted on it tell us how that scenario would play out. I, I'd be happy to try to get someone to talk to you. I, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. So why? Because it's if a farmer moves to Florida and makes five hundred thousand dollars a year off their farmland in cash rent. Do you think they pay Illinois income taxes on that? I think they're supposed to. Do you know? They, if the income is earned in Illinois, then they need to pay Illinois taxes. You know that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> ask and answer. Um, any, anything else? <laughs> You'd have Sen to ask his wife, Senator to call it. <laughs> Senator Brady, any other questions? Where, I'm, I'm being told by everyone who is advising yeah. me that it is where the income is earned you, but, but and not where one resides. You, but you don't have any experts here, and I, I think it's just this is a pretty serious issue. Uh, there, I, I do know for a fact that there are complicated allocation systems in place when you earn income in multiple states. And, that and typically those are, it's my understanding, typically those are as... A corporation. No, Single sales I know for a fact. It's, I things. know for a fact that it's not corporations. It applies to partnerships. And I understand there are there are sports folks and other people there like that. There are lawyers who have offices in multiple states, and they apportion their income based on where it was earned, where the work was performed. But you and can. So you but you can also choose to pay all of your income in Illinois, as I understand it. You can choose. You may have a corporation that's making and it may be sub-S income, and you may be making money in multiple states. You can choose just to pay the Illinois income tax and not pay the income tax in other states, which I think there needs to be part of an, uh, an could, interstate which, compact. Which something how it like this that. could move them to determining that they want to pay their income in other states proportionately, which They'd have could to then mean, earn their which, income in another state. Well, Senator, I think one of the flaws in this legislation is that most of these folks who make this kind of money have better attorneys than we in the Illinois Department of Revenue have. And they have I'm proven, their, on they have the proven their ability under the law to make the law work for their best interest. Why, and, why and, are they not all in Florida And in right most now? cases, we lose. Just the same reason the statistics show that income in this state has declined over the last 12 years That's the income because went up income in, has moved out of this state i believe there was a report today showing dramatic growth in income in illinois in the last year and a half two years personal income mm -hmm. I believe has declined over the last decade. In I think state. that's across the country. But I think Illinois has shown a remarkable rebound. I, I, I believe we, we lag in every barometric measure at least until the income tax dropped from five to the current rate. I believe it's the point being is that, I, I think there's a lot of unknowns and a lot that has not been taken into consideration about the dramatic effect this could have on an overall loss of income okay. in Illinois. And thank you, therefore, Senator I don't support the amendment. Senator, thank you very much, Senator Brady. Let's hit Senator Claiborne to roll. Senator Harmon to close. Thank you. I, I don't expect everyone to, um, to uh, support this. I want to emphasize we're not voting on any particular rates. We are voting on a, to send to the voters a constitutional amendment that would allow them to weigh in and give us a, a smarter tax policy like most every other state with an income tax in the federal government. A couple points were raised. We are surrounded by states with a fair tax system. Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Iowa's highest tax rate is 8.98%. Wisconsin's is at seven and three quarters, I believe, but it kicks in at, at 230 some thousand dollars. If we had Wisconsin's income tax structure here in Illinois, we wouldn't be having these conversations because we would have so much more revenue available to us, we would have passed a balanced budget. Um, two other things to, to close on. One, this issue about migration of millionaires that are suddenly going to pack all their boxes, they're not. We have too much going for us here in Illinois. 
I worry that we will have an out-migration, not only of millionaires, but of uh, upper middle class business owners if we don't bring some rationality and stability to state government and to our revenue system. And the final point I just want to make, Mr. Mesh made this point, sure. you've got to look at everything. And if you look at the entire collection of taxes that we pay, a middle class family pays a significantly greater portion of their annual income in taxes than does a wealthy family. Because property taxes are not determined by your ability to pay, sales taxes are not only not determined by your ability to pay, but when you spend every dime you make to buy things to keep your family going, you're spending a huge percentage of your annual income on the sales tax. A fair tax that does, that, uh, an income tax that does not recognize the marginal decreasing utility of money is not a fair tax. And this gives us the component to be more nimble in our tax policy, to build a basket of taxes that means someone making $50,000 doesn't pay so much more in their annual income than a family making $50 million. And for that, I ask for your eye votes. Before we have Senator Resin, you had your hand up by Mr. Jew. A, a brief comment, very brief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the, um, the sponsor of the bill, how much money does this bring in? None. This is a constitutional amendment that allows would, us to how, increase how rates. Would, if it's passed, how much would the... None. It's the, I, I, wanna, I really want to emphasize understand. it's so a constitutional amendment so that doesn't dictate rates. However, there's dollars. numbers with it, and, and a, what's a, been proposed yep. uh, it has been talked about that it would bring in a, a billion nine. 1.9 billion. 1.9 billion. So, uh, again, changing the structure when we have $8 billion in pass um, in bills and, you know, our pension plan uh, and everything in terms of the situation that we're in actually just is an open door for um, allowing higher taxes on the middle class such as is what's happened in other states such as California. So, I mean, that's just the point I want to make, especially when we're in it and uh, have not put any pressures on the growth of government in this state. So that's Thank you very concern. much, Senator Thank Rosen. You. There's a motion with Senator Harmon to, to adopt Senate Re Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment Number 1, second by President Cullerton. Clerk, please take the roll. Senator Severson? Senator Rezin? No. Senator Rodonio? Senator Lechtefeld? Senator Brady? Senator Murphy? Senator Trotter? No. Senator Staines? Aye. Senator Raul? Yes. Senator Munoz? Aye. Senator Link? Aye. Senator Lightford? Aye. Senator Hunter? President Cullerton? Aye. Senator Claiborne? Aye. Senator Silverstein? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. On that motion, there are 11 voting yes, 5 voting no, and it would be so reported. Back to Senator Harmon. Thank you, Representative Lang. Well, we're waiting for Senator Hastings. We can turn to Senator Tom Cullerton. You have a constitutional amendment as well. You are here on Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 29. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Senate Joint Resolution or Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 29 is uh, a constitutional amendment for the elimination of the lieutenant governor's position. Sorry, I thought I heard somebody asking something. Um, this bill uh, was actually back in two years ago. I was a sponsor on constitutional amendment number 18, which was now Congressman LaHood's bill. Uh, I'm bringing it forward this time uh, to obviously bring through the executive committee, have a vote on the floor. Uh, and then put on the ballot and give an opportunity to the voters. This is a good government bill and it'll save us about $1.6 million a year. Um, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator. You do have one witness, a Nanette Poti, on behalf of herself, I believe, the only witness to file in support or in opposition to your bill, your amendment. Questions? Senator Raul. Oh. Uh, more of a comment, and, 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 I, and I, I suppose I lied earlier because I said that er, earlier this morning that that was going to be the last time I, I voted for this bill. But uh, I may, this will be the last time I vote for, for, for this. 
amendment uh, just to give you an opportunity for, to, to, to have it heard on the floor. But Thank you, Senator. Um, I think that the, the challenge I have, have with this is, you know, we did make a change uh, several years ago to allow um, the candidates for governor to self-select who they would run for as their running mate. And this notion that um, um, the lieutenant governor's office is, doesn't really have a function. I think any governor, as this governor has done, can assign duties to the lieutenant governor. In fact, this, is, this constitutional amendment is sold as something that moves uh, us towards consolidation. One of the responsibilities that Governor Rauner has given uh, his lieutenant governor is- So it works is, perfectly. Is, is that, that function, so she is given real, uh, real work to do. Um, the notion that um, you can elect somebody governor, that the people elect somebody governor, and and whatever that philosophy they're embracing by do, by doing so, if something happens to the governor, you 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 revert to the uh, attorney general who may not share that philosophy at all, who may be of a, a different party than the elected governor. I think is 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 problematic and doesn't allow. Uh, for respecting the wishes of uh, of, of the voters, um, that said, uh, you know, because you're my good friend, I'm I'm going to offer you an I vote to get it uh, to the full floor. But um, thank you, Senator. I'm going to attack it once it gets to the floor. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Other questions, Senator? Rod Senator Rodone, you're then Senator. Rodone. Well, thank you. I think my concern runs pretty much along the lines of what Senator Rowe mentioned. I'm in favor of eliminating the office of lieutenant governor, but by just eliminating it and defaulting to the attorney general, you run into the situation that um, the senator described where you could have someone of a different party. I think there's other ways to um, approach this, whether it would be to eliminate it and have the um, succession be to the highest ranking person of the same party or to fold that function into the governor's office, but then not have a separate budget and staff for the lieutenant governor, just have it in the governor's office. So in favor of the idea, but that succession is a real problem in my mind, so I can't support it. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Cullerton, in light of Senator Rodonio's comments, in New Jersey, when the office of lieutenant governor becomes vacant, it becomes the Senate president gets the uh, position. So perhaps an amendment where if the governor is a Democrat, it would go to the Senate president, the governor is Republican, it would go to the, the Senate minority leader. So, so that in this so case, it would be Senator Bredonia would become the governor instead of Evelyn Sanquinetti. So would you be open to an amendment? So or you, or so perhaps, you perhaps, ask, your, you or perhaps Representative McSweeney. He's your got a bill as well going. Um, so you would ask Senator Tom Cullerton to run a bill that could possibly make Senate President John Cullerton the president, the governor of the state but of not, Illinois? But not currently, because on, uh, if Governor Rauner was to leave, then it would be Christine Bredonia would be the governor. And then we can perhaps start I, I, the impeachment I, proceedings. I, 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 <laughs> and we can get some Republican votes. But, um, but it responds to the uh, issue that was raised by I, the, I'm, I'm not the sure about the President of the Senate one. I don't know how that would, I don't know how the 10 o'clock news tonight would view me if I. Well, right now you got the Attorney that. General. Right, and I, and I would say from the Attorney General, uh, the point I would make on the Attorney General is the Attorney General is actually. Uh, elected statewide. Um, when we always come up in arguments about uh, leadership and terms of leadership, and as we saw in subcommittee today, I believe there were nine bills that dealt with leadership term limits uh, because people feel that they don't get an opportunity to vote on the leaders of the respective houses. Uh, they only feel that they get to vote on their legislator. Uh, so I would probably n not defer it to uh, any of the members of the legislature just due to the fact that one of the largest complaints I hear is not necessarily um, what the succession would be, but uh, as we saw from nine constitutional amendments that dealt with term limits specifically on leadership in the 
uh, legislative houses. I don't know if that would be the best way to amend well, it. Well, yes, but Senator Radonia would only be the governor until the next time she ran s statewide. And then she'd have to run. This is only to fill a vacancy when a vacancy occurs. And, and part of the reason that I ran this language specifically was because of um, the amount of sponsors that were on it from last time when uh, Senator, now Congressman LaHood ran it who are multiple members of this committee, and I'm using the exact same language that he used. Uh, that was specifically why I did it, because I didn't want to say I was trying to sneak anything through, wanted to say I'm using the exact same language he was using, um, which to me, uh, I looked at how many people endorsed him and pushed him through, and, and he won a resounding victory as a congressman and is, a, uh, from my understanding, doing a tremendous job and a wonderful congressman. Uh, so I figured that would be a good way to go. Senator Rodonio. Um, well, thank you. And I am aware that this is um, Congressman LaHood's bill and that it, many people sponsored it. Um, but we didn't really have a hearing on it until just now. So I think that that's the whole purpose of having a hearing. Uh, you know, I think you've heard from three members of this committee that the succession is a glaring flaw. And I wouldn't, I don't think that logic changes just because there were sponsors previously on a bill that hadn't been heard. So I think there's, again, many ways to um, amend this to address the succession issue that make more sense um, and provide more continuity than, than this program. Are there any other questions? Senator Brady. S Senator, under the Constitution, there's a limitation to the number of legislative initiative, I believe, that could be put before the electorate? Three, right? Three on the ballot. Three, Three articles. articles. Pardon me. How many questions? The cap in the Constitution is only three articles. So could there be more than three questions? But yes. only three articles? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator President Cullerton moves to recommend uh, that Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 29 be adopted. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senator Severson. Senator Rezin. Senator Rodonio. Senator Luchtefeld. Senator Brady. Senator Murphy. Senator Trotter. I don't know how I'm going to vote on the floor, but it's obvious there needs to be some more discussion. Uh, so I'm going to vote aye to get it out of committee. S Senator Staines. Yes. Senator Raul. Thank you, Senator. Senator Munoz. Aye. Senator Link. Yes. Senator Lightford. Aye for now. Thank you. Senator Hunter. Thank you. President Cullerton. No. Senator Claiborne. Aye. Senator Silverstein. No. Mr. Chairman. Aye, on that question. There are 12 voting aye, 4 voting no. I'd encourage you to run a very careful roll call heading Thank into you. the floor. Thank you, and Senator. The, uh, and the amendment will be so reported. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senators. Senator Hastings has joined us. Unless there's some objection, we'll turn away from constitutional amendments briefly to take up floor amendment number one to Senate Bill 3095. Can we add, but oh, there we are. We have just one witness, uh, Stephanie Voyes from uh, the um, uh, beer distributors is available for oral testimony if, if needed. Senator Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This, I brought this bill last time in regards to an importing distributor's license. Currently, right now, we file the floor amendments, and uh, ABDI and the wine distributors are working on it. Very convincing, Senator Raul. Well, you want to very much. Go ahead and please go ahead. So you I just want to state that we, that we would ask that it passes out of this committee and passes on the floor and goes to the House so they can continue to work on these concerns, and they are in agreement that they will work on them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Owen moves to recommend uh, do adopt floor amendment number one to Senate Bill 3095. Is there a leave for the attendance roll call? Seeing no objection, leave is granted. The amendment will be so reported. Thank you, Senator. All right, we'll turn now back to the constitutional amendment. Senator Raul, you have Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 30. We'll put that in the record.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 30 uh, is a, um, a redistricting um, amendment. It's substantially similar to uh, a resolution that uh, passed the Senate, I believe, five years ago, um, except that it adds uh, congressional districts. Um, the resolution uh, would call for redistricting process that would allow uh, for denesting. Um, it, uh, in order to make sure that both in um, uh, legislative and rep re representative districts, um, we have the greatest f flexibility to respect communities of interest. Uh, it would enshrine the voting, the Illinois Voting Rights Act uh, protection into the Constitution. It would allow for the um, legislature to uh, attempt to uh, uh, redistrict by way of legislation um, with a simple majority and uh, um, approval of the governor. Uh, if that's unsuccessful uh, by June 20th, uh, each chamber uh, would be have an opportunity to do so independently by way of resolution with a supermajority of a three-fifth. Um, if that's unsuccessful by July 20th, then it would revert to a commission appointed by the legislative uh, leaders. Um, and if that were uh, unsuccessful by August 20th, it would uh, shift to uh, a special master appointed by the senior uh, most Supreme Court justices of each party. Before you continue, Senator Trotter is being called to another committee and would uh, ask that we uh, open the roll. So Senator uh, Trotter moves to recommend uh, do that the Senate Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment 30 be adopted. If there's no objection, we'll record Senator Trotter is voting aye. Thank you. So Senator Rule, please proceed. Um, you know, again, this is substantially similar to uh, other than the addition of the uh, congressional districts and, and probably the enshrining of the Voting Rights Act into the Constitution to the proposal that the Senate passed five years ago that was uh, supported by the uh, Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Um, and uh, I think one of the aspects of this, which is uh, particularly important to uh, certain communities, and, and I know we highlighted the Chinatown community the last time, is, is I think this has uh, as opposed to other redistricting proposals, this has superior protection for uh, communities of interest and uh, voting rights. Thank you. Questions? There are no witnesses, uh, by the way, but uh, any questions? Seeing none, the roll, is, the roll is open. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senator Severson, Senator Rezin, Senator Redonio, Senator Lechtefeld, Senator Brady, Senator Murphy, Senator Staines, Senator Raul, yes. Senator Munoz, Aye. Senator Link, yes. Senator Lightford, Senator Hunter, President Cullerton, Aye. Senator Claiborne, Aye. Senator Silverstein, Mr. Chairman. Aye. On that question, there are 11 voting aye, five voting no, and the amendment will be so reported. Thank you, Senator. We have two final measures before the uh, committee today. Uh, Senator Claiborne, you have a floor amendment number two to Senate Bill 2989. Would you like to take that up? We have two proponents of uh, the uh, Jeremy Grudner on behalf of the Wine and Spirits Distributors, available for oral testimony. Uh, John Potts, also a record of appearance only. There are no opponents to your bill or your amendment. Senator Claiborne. Thank you. Uh, this is just a, a, a requirement to make sure that we're not losing uh, revenue with shipments and we're requiring creating a shipper's license, uh, which would include all addresses from which the applicant intends to ship wine including any locations of a third party authorized to ship wine on behalf of the manufacturer. 
The amendment provides that a third party provider shipping wine for a winery shipper's license holder is considered an agent and the license holder is responsible for acts or, or omissions. Um, um, basically, we, we're losing revenue and we're trying to find a way to make sure there is transparency and a way to track the wine that's coming into our state. Uh, as stated, there is no opposition. This has been worked out with all parties. Is there any discussion? Any questions? Senator Rodonio. <laughs> Um, what, how do we know we're losing revenue? What's the evidence of this? Is de does the Department of Revenue um, agree that we're losing that? Is the, is the green light? There you are. Yeah. Jeremy Crichton here with the Wine and Spirits Distributors. I certainly can't speak on behalf of the Department of Revenue, but we've had many discussions with them. Um, there was a Channel 7 investigation that showed border crossing both with uh, trucks driving from Indiana uh, that are bringing liquor in, being sold, so there wouldn't be any um, excise or sales tax collected in Illinois through that. And then with internet sales, uh, the reason for all this information on the third party providers, it's very difficult to track if uh, a winery is licensed with, if they're using a third party provider to ship the wine, so this will help uh, with that process. Other questions? Move. Senator Raul moves to recommend do adopt floor amendment number two to Senate Bill 2989. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senator Severson. Senator Rezin. Senator Rodonio. Senator Lechtefeld. Senator Brady. Senator Murphy. Senator Trotter. Senator Staines, yes. Senator Raul, yes. Senator Munoz, Aye. Senator Link, Aye. Senator Lightfoot, Senator Hunter, President Cullerton, Aye. Senator Claiborne, Aye. Senator Silverstein, Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Senator Brady. Aye. Senator Brady. On that question, there are uh, 13 voting aye, 14 voting aye, none voting no, and the amendment will be so reported. Our last measure is Senator Munoz's floor amendment. Do you want to call that today, Senator Munoz? We have it posted for tomorrow as well, if you'd, uh, but we can take it up right now. We'll post that amendment for tomorrow when we are, when we convene the Senate Executive Committee. I was going to move as soon as you just said something else. There being no further business to come before the Senate Executive Committee, we stand adjourned.